Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to room one. Hacking heuristic, exploiting the narrative. If you are not in the right room, well, stay for this talk because it's going to be really interesting. So I'd like to introduce you to Kelly, who's an operator at a red team operator at Spectre Ops, and she's presenting today, Hacking Heuristic, Exploiting the Narrative. Let's give her a warm clap of uh, applause. Um, hi, I, I'm Kelly. I want to start off this talk with a story, um, which is how I define a narrative, because I think it's the best way to, to show, um, to just show examples. <laughs> um, so the second, my second month of work, I was trying to tailgate into a building. A manager was like, just, you know what, research it, tailgate in, it's no big deal, it's very easy to do. Um, and on my second time trying, I was going in, and I was following people, I was doing everything right. I was going in at 8.30, which is when employees went in. I was um, on my phone, um, having a very intense conversation with my mom. And, and also I had coffee, and, and still someone grabbed my arm, and he goes, who are you? What are you doing here? What's your purpose? Who do you work for? I, my job is not worth this. And what I didn't take into consideration was that I was dressed like this. I was not taking my overall narrative into consideration. And, and it, appearance matters. As much as people like to say that appearance doesn't matter, it's all about what's inside, it does. Um, not just for social engineering, um, but for the broader red team context. Um, I want to qualify this talk and say that this is not a social engineering, physical penetration type of talk. This is, this is about behavioral economics and the way that computers take on the biases of their owners and how we can then exploit that in computer networks. I, I, I am very excited about it. Um, I, I hope you are too. Um, but there is one caveat that I want to make sure I address. Um, I use a lot of analogies and metaphors, but they only go so far, right? Um, analogies and metaphors are great for explaining concepts, but uh, sometimes the actual implementation, if you take them too literally, does not work. So um, the, the point of this presentation is to give very technical people, red teamers, uh, a broader context of, of new ways to attack systems. Um, and it's to give maybe less technical people a, a, a broader perspective for different ways that we hack companies. Um, so who am I? That's the big question, right? Um, I, I am a, a red team operator at Spectre Ops. Um, we did a training um, here earlier this week. Uh, I do a few different trainings. Um, mostly, though, I'm a consultant, and I, I go and do red teams and penetration tests for clients. And I've been doing that for about three years. Um, before Spectre Ops, it was another type of company, usually Fortune 500, 100. Um, and just large scale environments with the uh, objective of getting domain admin. Um, before that, I was a business major at the University of Miami, and I, I felt kind of like this, this ditto Pokemon for a while with the imposter syndrome. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'm gonna expand, and that's why there's a to be continued, about there's more to you than than just a few different characteristics. And, and the ways that we can use our different characteristics are our competitive advantage. Um, so uh, Tifkin, um, Lee Christensen, he was one of the trainers at the um, Spectre Ops course uh, at, uh, at North Sec. He coined the term red team analytics. And I, I really like thinking about it that way. Um, it's employing different types of tradecraft that uh, gives you the appearance of blending in with the caveat that sometimes that will get you detected, right? And this presentation focuses heavily on blending in and then also small ways to stick out, uh, or not stick out, sorry, um, small ways to be unique so that you can avoid incident response. By definition, incident response is based on rules, and these rules are very granular. So if I can, fall, if I can just evade one or two of those rules, it, it gets a lot harder to, to detect. And for a red team operator, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I want to do. Um, so the best mix is, uh, the best way to do it is to mix both of them. You want to blend in and you want to be unique in a very targeted manner. Um, so the, my, my title, Hacking Heuristics, 
not all people know what a heuristic is, um, so I want to make sure I define that. I'll be defining a few different things throughout this presentation, uh, just so that we're all on the same level. Um, and the way that I think about heuristics um, are two different ways. One, one of which being mental shortcuts from the behavioral side. And from the computer side, it's, it's algorithmic shortcuts, right? It's the way that computers are also making the same types of mistakes. And it's pervasive. It's not just uh, behavior and computer. It's, it's everywhere. Um, these mental shortcuts are based on speed. And speed kind of rules everything around us, right? We want our programs to be fast. And that's why like, innovation is happening so quickly. Um, and that's exploitable. It's fun. Um, <laughs> And, and, and one thing I want to hone in, um, especially at the beginning, uh, considering I've been talking about the narrative, that it's really the moments that we remember and not the routine. Um, the routine is stuff that we do every day, whereas the big moments, those things that change our lives, right? That's, that's what we think about and what we tell people and, how, and what we use to describe stuff. So if, if we're thinking about, from an incident response perspective, what is important to them might be what everyone in the news has been reporting on lately. And it's hard to avoid the narrative in that way. Um, so I want to give a few examples of um, the, the automated tasks that our brains make really quickly, things that just happen, um, versus very thoughtful responses uh, on more of the behavioral side. So, Automatic or scripted, if you're thinking in, a, in the computer lens, is just stepping out of the way. Like if someone's coming at me, I know, step aside, right? Um, also, driving through your hometown, I, I know easily, I just follow the stop signs, I'm thinking about many other things at the same time. And on the other hand, calculated responses, I'm gonna start with the bottom. Doing math, math is very hard if you have a good problem. You're thinking a lot about it. and that, that cognitive power that goes into that is, is hard to do, and you can't replicate that for driving through your hometown, or else you'd never get anything done. So this presentation overall is a, it could be surmised in words matter, and how we describe things matter. Um, the narrative seduces people into thinking that they know what's going on because of words, which is, um, very important for our understanding and our ability to communicate, but then we need to think about what these narratives are and, and ways that we can then use them and weaponize them, if you're a red teamer, or from a defensive side, recognize that these narratives might not be reality. Um, perception and reality are often changed by a narrative. Um, so next I'm gonna get, go into a case study. Uh, in this case study, uh, there were um, it was done in the 1980s. Uh, people were asking, hey, can I cut in front of you in line to use this Xerox machine? And uh, in example one, it was, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use a Xerox machine? 60% of people let them cut in front, which makes sense. People are usually nice. Um, and then the second one, which had a much higher statistic, it was, excuse me, I have five um, pages, uh, may I use a Xerox machine? I'm in a rush. That makes sense because there's justification, right? The justification, you would assume, makes a lot of sense. And the third one also has a justification. Um, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use the Xerox machine because I have some copies to make. But the justification doesn't actually mean anything. It's just more words, right? So um, for a second, just think in your heads, what percentage of people do you think let them cut in line? I was surprised to find out 93%. That's crazy to me, because that means, like, and it's just people recognizing justification and being like, yes, that matters. Um, so that's, from a social engineering perspective, that's very valuable. But like I said, this talk is not about social engineering. Um, and it's not about social engineering, but we're going to keep on talking about behavioral heuristics so that then we can better understand red team operations. So uh, a few common behavioral heuristics that are um, kind of pervasive across the field, um, availability, familiarity, and, and those um, can both be surmised in the overall, um, we think um, intuitively, intuitively that uh, different types of events have a similar um, likelihood of occurrence when really they don't. Similarities, uh, you, can't, you can't just think that because an event is like something you experienced before that'll happen again. It's, it's also why, I mean, racism happens, right? You see something happen once, 
And then you, that's your perception of an entire group of people. And that, in, and that grouping is pretty bad. Um, representativeness is when an, in, when an individual uh, judges the representativeness of a new event, people usually pay attention to the degree of similarity between the event and the process. So for this one, I'm gonna give an example because I think examples are, are a much better way um, to, to kind of show these in action. Um, it's called the Linda Problem. It's, it's by Daniel Kahneman, who is one of my personal heroes. Uh, if you're interested in behavioral science, behavioral, behavioral economics, I highly suggest the book Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, I read it when I was in college, and it was incredibly, I, it, I think about this book once a week, um, at least, and it's been years now. Um, but the Linda Problem is, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with the issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So knowing that, I, I have a question. What is more likely, that Linda is a bank teller, or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? Um, so there's no option three. There's only two options. Who thinks option one? Okay, and who thinks option two? Okay, um, so the more, uh, the, the real answer is that Linda is a bank teller because um, the probability of two different events occurring together is always going to be less than or equal to the probability of one occurring alone. And to everyone that said option two, um, which given the, the context that I gave before, is a much higher probability. Like, you would make that assumption. That's a normal assumption to make. And also, 80% of respondents said number two. Um, and I, I think that, like, for everyone that said option one, if you were asked that question in the context of just co regular conversation and not talking about behavioral science, the fast response might have geared toward, towards number two. I know I fell for it. Um, but I think it's a good example of the way that our brains think quickly and the way that we can anchor ideas into it is incredibly important to our understanding of the world. So I've like talked down about heuristics of a fair amount, but the truth is we need them. We need them a lot because we make 35,000 decisions a day. That's crazy, 35,000 decisions. I mean, I, I quoted Quora, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't know, Google search. Um, even if it's not exactly 35, it's around that many. And, and every decision that we make is a small prediction about what we believe the future to be. There is a, there's a lot of cognitive uh, computing that goes on into each of these decisions. So we need to think fast, and maybe we don't always need to be right. That's what a heuristic is, it's a mental shortcut. Um, and so I, I'm gonna give a quick example about my morning routine. But I, I hope that all of you can see your own morning routine and see the similarities. So I wake up with an alarm clock. Um, I see, I decide, what do I want to wear to work? I, there's a few different options, whatever. Um, I decide, do I want to have tea? Do I want to have coffee? Do I want to eat? And then I think about the bus schedule. And the bus schedule can be anywhere, in, so I'm from Seattle. The bus schedule could take me anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to get to the office. And if I want to be there on a certain time, it involves some planning. And that planning, I'm usually pretty good at predicting. I'm usually good at understanding about how long it'll take me to get to the office. In general, people are great at predicting. People are awesome at it. Um, except when the narrative comes into play. When the narrative comes into play, oops, oh wait, I have this. Um, when the narrative comes into play, Everything is out the window. Um, early in, uh, earlier this year, there was a, the, the viaduct in Seattle um, shut down, and everyone freaked out. It was everywhere. It was in all of the buses. It was all over the news because also there's a financial scandal going on. And people kept on talking about the viaduct closing and what that would do. And in my head, I thought, oh, wow, it's going to take me twice as long to get to work. And guess what? It didn't at all. It took me less time to get to work because everyone was thinking about this stuff. It, it, it completely ruined my ability to predict um, because of what people were telling me. It, it gave me, uh, the, the more I heard it, the more I believed it. Um, and 
In general, narratives get in the way of our ability to predict the future because people like causation. People love finding the root cause of whatever problem they have, and there's a lot of validity to that, right? Especially incident response. You want to find the root cause so that you can fix it in the future. Um, and then uh, people also like talking about interesting topics. People communicate interesting things to one another. No one wants to hear about what you had that morning for breakfast. They want to hear the viaduct is billions of dollars in debt or however much it was, um, probably millions. And then also, the more that you hear something, the more you start to believe it. And I, I'm a strong believer that repetition is more important to the believability of a statement of an individual than the veracity of a statement. You can be convinced of lies all the time. Um, here I have a picture of the Great Wall of China. And fun fact, you can't see the Great Wall of China from space. Um, how many people knew that? <laughs> oh, okay, more people than I assumed. Maybe I'm just behind. Um, but that flabbergasted me because that's something that I'd been hearing my entire life by multiple people. I can't tell you who told me it or source that information, but it was just part of my understanding of the world. And the more things, the more uh, frequently things are repeated, the more likely people in general are, are allowed to are, uh, believe them. Um, so this is one of the last slides before I start getting technical. I promise it happens. You just got to give a good, good understanding so that everyone's on the same page. Um, but the, the similarities between experience and context, and I like to think of context as situational awareness during a red team, right? You, you hop onto an environment, you go, what is going on? Um, what do I do now? I think uh, uh, the, um, the, direc the director of the red team at Walmart has just been going through um, all these different like narratives of what do you do first, all this stuff. And with experience, you can better predict the future. That's what experience gives you. Um, and that's what makes experience really valuable. And, and that's how you create that context and, and you get better at predicting. I, I, when I first joined the field, I was very overwhelmed because I saw my coworkers and other people on Twitter that were just amazing at what they did. And what I didn't take into consideration was they have a lot of experience in this. I joined a, a, um, an environment, I, I just got my initial foothold, and I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. Whereas they have the recency of events and things that have worked in the past, and that's what they start going after. That's very valuable. Um, and then here is, is a, a graph of you have an experience, right? Your brain takes that experience in, it indexes it, it makes it so that one, it's in there, two, you can call it out easily, and then your, your, your perception of the world changes. And that's the real thing, and that's how you can create context, is creating these new experiences at both, the beha uh, both like a personal interaction and also a network level. Um, so people think in references and relationships, and so does Active Directory. Um, this is a very, very simplified version of Active Directory, but these are the parts that I'm going to talk about. Um, so please don't, <laughs> we don't need to argue about the simplicity of this. Um, users, right, are part of certain different types of groups. And if you think about, if I think about the types of groups that I'm in, it's, um, I live in Seattle, like all, all the characteristics about me. Um, and then from there, with these certain groups in Active Directory, then you, you have special privileges or certain groups too, where you can log into machines remotely, you can do different things. Um, one tool that a, a coworker put out that is, this chart is a mess, right? It's kind of overwhelming, but it's mapping out all of the different objects in a domain to the, um, to, to how you get to domain admin. And I know that there was already a talk given about Bloodhound, um, so I won't get into it too much, but these mappings of relationships and these mappings of, of just an entire network, uh, also you, you can map your personal network and start seeing the relationships in all of these things. Bloodhound, I think, is, is a great example of the narrative in action, right? I want the shortest path, oh wait, next slide. I want. I want to get to domain admin as fast as possible. So what I use, um, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, and I'm going to blame the initial graphic <laughs> uh, just because of, of how much is going on in the slide. But if I start over here, right, I'm on that computer, that was my initial foothold, and I want to get there as fast as possible. 
and I have a, the footprint of how all, all these relationships are defined, then, then I would um, notice that this user is uh, a member of a certain group. The problem also with this graph is that this is real client data. Um, and Andy Robbins, he's um, underscore Waldo. He, he's one of the main guys that runs Bloodhound. I highly suggest you follow him. But he takes real client data to try to show real threats. And then he just takes out client sensitive information. But when you run, when you have Bloodhound, you could see the fastest way to get to domain admin. And I'm, I'm a big believer of the path of least resistance. I love that because I want to do my job as easily as possible. Like, I don't want to make my life harder. And knowing that this user is a member of a certain group that is an admin of a computer <laughs> uh, that is logged in and part of the, uh, and, sorry, um, who is a member of then the domain admins group, that's my path right there. That's exactly what I want. And within Bloodhound, um, you can change the graphs. You can, you can, um, just open specific things, and it's, it's, a, it's a much better tool than I'm explaining it to be. I encourage all of you to check it out. Um, but still, having all of this stuff, if you create the context, or you're creating new groups, right? You're creating new users, which I do not suggest you do, because then it, people start, clients start getting worried, but that narrative will change the reality of that domain. Um, so what narratives allow us to do is, is to create context and create really the situational awareness of what's going on. Um, so now I'm going to get into the, the different types of ways that you can use context to blend into your environments. That's a big thing about red teaming is you don't want to get caught. If you get caught, hmm, room for improvement. <laughs> um, so the first thing is social interactions, and then we'll slowly get uh, more technical. Um, I'm going to give a, a few examples of physicals. Um, that's something that I initially started with because um, it just it made sense. And the first question that I had to ask myself is, who do people think I am? And who people think I am is not a SpectreOps Red Team operator or, at the time, um, a penetration testing consultant. They don't think that I'm a graduate from the University of Miami. Um, and they, they're not, so X out on that. My mom, who I care about a lot, she describes me as intense. Um, my my uh, friends from college, uh, say that I'm very hardworking. Uh, my coworkers say that I have a bad sense of humor, but I'm very energetic. No, none of that matters. What really matters is your appearance, right? And and figuring out what is your first impression before someone even sees you. You can't do physicals without that. You gotta you gotta know yourself. Um, so I, I have a blog post about how to figure out who you are. So I won't get into that now because time is limited and um, there's only so much time. But I found out that I have three different profiles I like to use. The second one, event planner, I've never, I've used that one once. I avoid it because tailgating is not my forte, as I started with. Um, so I, I try to avoid that one. That, that would be me blending in with an overall company. I use the intern one when I'm trying to clone badges because people love helping interns as long as it doesn't at mean like that they actually have to do something. So if I walk up to someone, I say, help, I'm lost. My badge cloner's here. And they're like, oh my gosh, of course you're lost. You're an intern. Then they'll give me directions. I have their badge, stuff like that. But if I want to do something like privilege escalation and I want to convince someone to do something, then I need to be an attorney. When I'm an attorney, I'm dressed more like this. I'm wearing a dress and heels. I put on lipstick. I try to, one, make myself look older. Um, two, I have, a, I have a nicer purse. I'm not using a backpack. I am asserting authority, and it's a different tone of voice as well, right? Interns are scared often, easy to pull off. Um, and attorneys are very direct and, and to the point. Usually, I just talk to myself in the mirror that morning and, and try to establish that, but it's giving the perception of who you are. It's, it's really trying to give that narrative. Um, and then in the same way, these are all things that I have done in real life. So when I'm creating these profiles, I, I know them very well because um, I used to be a privacy consultant, right? Like I worked with a lot of lawyers. Um, I, I was an intern at, some po at one point. Um, and then I've planned events. And, and in that way, I can be very real and people, people recognize real. Um, so once we, once we change our, once we 
think about the narrative more, we can see how we can change the reality of the situation. Um, here, it's, it's more just a fun slide of, of my personal toolkit. Um, one night I was bored in a hotel, and then the, uh, usually when I'm an intern, I use a backpack, and then my attorney um, go-to is, is a nicer bag, right? It's something that attorneys would use. I looked at all the attorney bags. I like Google them. What do attorneys use? <laughs> Um, so then next I'll be getting into more inter um, internal penetration testing, uh, going through the like living off the land philosophy. We'll start there. Um, it was coined by Symantec in 2017, uh, where uh, you're using the tools that are already in an environment. So living off the land assumes that you have that initial foothold on there. And living off the land is, is just taking advantage of stuff that, that's there. That's great because, um, Oh, I should have said this before. What do people use? Um, the, living off the land is very doable because you have things like Adobe, and I am a big fan of Adobe. I like photography, so I use it. And last week, um, Matthew Green tweeted out all these CVEs that they just dropped in one update. That's crazy, right? So from the living off the land perspective, I don't need to build all of my own stuff. I don't need to create new exploits. I'm just going to use the Adobe application that is on almost everyone's computer. Um, another thing is browser extensions. Browser extensions are awesome. Um, uh, uh, there's uh, <laughs> a person, uh, Zori or X-O-R-I-O-R, his name's Chris Ross. Um, he he uh, made a browser extension exploit for Mac OS, and this is just the general synopsis of it. Um, I don't want to get into it too much, uh, just because a lot of information. Um, and then Microsoft Office, I have here included macros, macros, and more macros, but there is so much more to Microsoft Office than just macros. Macros are just what everyone talks about, so included. Um, this is a, a fun thing that I used to do. It's actually my first programming language that I really spent a lot of time with, Word Basic. It comes before VBA, um, and for a, time, for, for a little bit, um, you could use Word Basic, it'd be automatically um, changed into VBA, but it wasn't getting detected by incident response because the syntax was in Word Basic. And it's these small obscurities that really drive the, um, that, really, that, that really help you exploit things. Uh, that was great, and then Microsoft started catching it. Um, this is a, a quick overview of Procdump. I'm, I'm sure a few of you Red Teamers are very familiar with it. That's why this is a internal penetration testing um, uh, uh, section, but what Procdump does is it's a Microsoft signed tool, so you would download Windows Sys internals, uh, and that's great, it's Microsoft signed, it won't get it detected as easily, except now they know, oh shoot, people use Procdump maliciously. Um, and then from there what you do is you dump the LSAS memory with that tool. And what LSAS is, is it's, um, it's responsible for enforcing security policies on a system, and it verifies uh, users that are logging into Windows computers on on computers, servers, all of the above. So if you can get that LSAS file, you can get credentials using Mimikatz. Mimikatz will get flagged by pretty much everything. Uh, or, or it should. It should get flagged by pretty much everything because it's a no malicious tool. So instead what you do is you pull that back onto your own computer and I just turn off Windows Defender in a, in a VM or else they'll kill my Mimikatz and I'm like, no, 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 I'm trying to be malicious. Um, and from there, I can still obtain the passwords, right? And it's just using the things that are already installed. Windows Sys internals is very common. I've, I've never been on an Active um, Directory environment, and every company uses Active Directory that I've ever tested um, that didn't have Sys internals installed. Oops. Um, so then another one of living off the land is um, uh, Cassava, um, I'm gonna butcher his name. Uh, Fitzel, he, he noticed that if he created applications in the, in the, um, Mac sto in the um, Apple store, that he could then uh, do privilege escalation. And by doing that, it's already, it's already in the Apple store. It's, the, it, um, people trust that because it, it goes through a process. He had to get a developer ID, it took him about a week. Um, he had to learn Swift, which took him about a week. No, sorry, I'm getting the developer ID was fast and then uh, it took him about a week to learn Swift. But from there, he could develop his own application that is also an, uh, an Apple, it's from the Apple um, store and that's, that's very uh, good. <laughs> um, and 
Yeah, next slide. <laughs> um, so then now we're going to get into network traffic, and, and specifically infrastructure. Infrastructure is, is a large concept that I could talk about for five hours and still not give you a good enough impression. So we're just going to run through a few different things that are especially relevant to behavioral heuristics. Um, for those of you that are, aren't aware, um, a command and control platform, C2, is a way for me to execute commands remotely onto a system and then have them return an output. Uh, the tools that I, my company uses is usually Cobalt Strike, but there's a lot out there. There's Empire, there's AppBell, there's, um, there's Faction. I, I have a few of them up on my computer here. There's a good amount of C2 tools, but it's just all that stuff. Um, and, but the first step of infrastructure is figuring out what type of cloud provider do you want to use because they're all different. And what story do you want to use with each cloud provider because they each give you different types of functionality. The benefits of AWS was domain fronting. That's a little bit dead. Um, it's been dead in Google for like one or two years, so I think, I think they're a little behind. But you could still domain front with Azure. Um, also, AWS is, is the industry standard. Um, the benefits of using Azure is that it, people are very familiar with it, um, and the documentation is there. Uh, people use uh, DigitalOcean because of team management. It's very easy to use. It's probably the fastest way for someone to spin up uh, infrastructure for their first time. Um, but I am a big fan of Google Cloud, um, mostly because of their uh, cloud run uh, functionality. So I'm going to use Google and Microsoft to, to show how you tell a story with your infrastructure and, and evade detection. Um, so here, um, this is Cobalt Strike, the, the C2 that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see these are general profiles. Do not use these during an op because they will get flagged. You need to modify them, right? And, and if you click on them, you can make the modifications with the header files. Um, but the, the Gmail one is, is relevant to Google. The, um, the Microsoft one's relevant to Microsoft. You get the idea. Within all of these C2 profiles are unique parameters. So here are a few, and there are way more, um, parameters that you can change in Cobalt Strike. The same way that I, when I wear different things, I give off a certain perception. You see that there's a lot of similarities in the way that we think about infrastructure and we think about sending traffic or trying to emulate certain types of traffic that there are to how you present yourself and, and stuff along those lines. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so here um, is a potential infrastructure setup. If you have infrastructure questions, really the best resource is Blue Screen of Jeff's Red Team Infrastructure Wiki. Um, it has so many resources, and if he didn't write the blogs himself, he has a bunch of resources, and people have been helping him build out this wiki to give as much information as possible. So right now I'm going to focus on the short term um, C2, which is the easiest one to stand up. Usually you want to focus on how much effort does it take to stand up a different type of C2 um, versus like maybe a long-term one, something you don't want to get burned. The short-term ones are domain fronting, which is kind of dead now, um, except for Azure. So uh, earlier this week, I um, just went in, made a CDN profile. I can now um, send my traffic through fuzzy.azureedge.net, and azureedge.net is a Microsoft domain. That's, that's fantastic. And it took me 30 seconds to create. Um, and, and the speed is a huge portion of it, because I don't want to spend too much time. Um, something a lot more complicated is domains. Domains are, are tricky. Oh, where, wait. There we go. Um, domains are tricky. So first, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about telling a story with, with Microsoft. Um, I have an addiction with buying domains. It's kind of a big problem. It's, it's a problem, but you know what? I could be buying things on Amazon, so it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, I own cloudmicrosoft.com. So if I want to um, send traffic and I want to blend in with Microsoft, I'm going to use cloudmicrosoft.com, and I'm going to use Azure services so that it's still being pulled back through the same way. And the profiles that I would use is I would modify this Microsoft update get only profile. Whoa. Um, if I want to tell a story with Google, and recently because I've been very, I've been interested in GCP, um, I bought a few different Google products in their domains and also an API because these are things that people are likely to overlook. It blends in well, right? And, and if our objective is blending in, 
this is what you want to do. And the Cobalt Strike profile I, I chose for this one was just Google Drive, get only. But I, I can't stress this enough. All of these profiles will be burned because they're known malicious. You have to modify them yourselves. Um, and so another way that I can blend in with real Google things, and being real is very important, because people can spot fakes very easily. Like, like when someone is, is not giving off, when someone isn't being real, you can tell that. Um, so I, I was using the Google Cloud Run platform. I, it, it's, it's a little bit similar to, um, to uh, Ronnie Flan, uh, Flanders, Fl Flathers, I'm sorry for butchering that name, um, his serverless toolkit, but I could set it to my own domain, kellyvillanueva.com. Um, and, and being able to do that, I also can set up very easily Google infrastructure um, or like a, a Google IP ad address. And when you check um, Aaron and who is, you see that it's coming from Google. None of that is a red flag yet. There are other things that, that you have to take into consideration, but overall, you want all these things to align. You want to be able to tell a story with it. Um, so this is a quote I took from some or many 14 and 15 year old girls. Realize, realize, realize. Um, and, and mostly that's getting into how to be legit. Like how, how can you make yourself out to be exactly who you want to be? Um, and the thing is, is real websites are categorized. So I took Cloud Microsoft, one that I bought a few months ago. Um, and then I, I went to uh, domain categorization websites and I got it categorized as business and economy. Awesome. Uh, that will then not get blocked as easily um, from different solutions. Here are some of the vendors um, and a dog that is pretending to be 21. Um, but there are a lot more vendors. Uh, they're included in the Red Team Wiki and also blog posts that I've put out about um, infrastructure. Another part of being real is that real websites have existed for more than a week. That's like a big thing is if you, um, if you buy a domain and then three days later you use it, Ah, uh, that's not good. It's like the one week minimum. Um, one time I, I uh, was at a client and they did not allow any track, any any emails to come in unless they'd been sent an email from that domain within the um, that prior year. That's on the more extreme example, but the length of time matters. So during a red team, we could blow through fifteen or ten to fifteen domains, uh, but. You, like, so you have to buy things early and prepare. It's all about the preparation, right? Um, this one I bought in November. Um, I still probably wouldn't use it for a few months and just let it sit there for a while. The next one, uh, real websites have certificates. Um, there was a talk given yesterday about how easy it is to set up certificates. As an attacker, if I see, like, not my own website, but if I see a website that is using HTTP, I'm like, oh, man. Whoa, what is going on here? And because of my background in privacy, if I don't see a privacy policy at the bottom, another red flag, right? You want to you wanna do what other websites do. And you do that by being like other websites. So I, I go to, um, this is a Behance or Behance, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's an Adobe website, and you can download templates of websites. And from there, you can just add that and blend in with your traffic. You make a, a few modifications to the HTML, and then from there, it looks like a very legitimate website, especially for logon pages. Um, and then the last one, emails. So emails, there are so many different uh, <laughs> email uh, avenues to get in, right? It's like an infinite amount. The stuff gets blocked all the time. One of my favorite stories was uh, I was working for a Fortune 100, and we were doing a phishing campaign. And I sent an email, and I, I, I gave it a really good narrative, right? I'm an attorney, because I, I know attorneys well, and I know how they speak, and it's, there is this really sensitive documentation coming out, and here's a key, um, and then use this key to decrypt the macro. Great. And actually what happened is they whitelisted all domains, which is pretty mature for a client, and <laughs> their head of IT gave me a call and goes, uh, is this for real? And I'm like, Yes, um, but if you have a strong enough narrative, you can still bypass even the strongest of restrictions. So all of these uh, mentioned earlier, um, the reasons why phishing wouldn't work is mostly you didn't put enough time and energy. Phishing is annoying because it takes obscurity. It takes a lot of, takes a lot of time to develop good things. 
Domain categorization takes a while. You have to go through, for very obvious purposes, it, you can't really automate it. You have to go to each site and submit it, and you have to have a real site with HTTPS already on it, or else they're gonna say, this is malicious, and you get flagged, and then you can't send any traffic through there. Um, also, if you don't create a very realistic phishing template, people are not going to click on it. Uh, now there's user awareness campaigns. If you send something like, hey, I had this awesome trip to Nigeria, all you have to do is click this link, and then you're going to Nigeria to meet the prince, no one's gonna click that. So you need to, you need to start obscuring them and making them very believable. What I do is I fish myself, right? Like, I think about what are normal emails? What, what are things that I would click on? Um, I have a horrible habit of fishing my mom because I think that that is usually like my target audience is, is well, if my mom will click on it, I bet other people will too, if she's in the same demographic. Uh, but it's all, it's, it's, it's all in good fun. She, she, she's fine with it, user, aware, user awareness. Um, but think about what, why would you download a file? So expanding on who I am, um, I used to be a privacy consultant, that's what I started in, was GDPR, and that is usually my main thing, is, is I love to really attack the, <laughs> the attorneys and the lawyers, and um, when GDPR was popular, I had a good phishing campaign pretending to be like a, a Danish woman who is uh, trying to exercise her right to be forgotten with this document about all this stuff, and attorneys are like, whoa, 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 oh my gosh, GDPR is happening, because there was a lot of buzz about it, and it was a hot topic at the time. And then they weren't suspicious at all. I just gave them a, a good reason about, I want to be forgotten for whatever stuff. And it's very specific. Also, a fun fact about lawyers is with GDPR, they have access to all of the data maps. So for me, extra valuable. I also was an accounting intern. Um, and I, I worked in the Treasury Operations Department. So I, I have a good understanding of what they'll click on, such as macro-enabled Excel files. Excel files, I'm a big believer. Excel is the second best <laughs> programming language, application, whatever, for any task. And the best, <laughs> the, best, um, what, the best application is the one that the task was actually built for. But Excel can do everything. So if I make a really good Excel file that does something very helpful, people will not question that. People will think, oh, awesome. I can, I'm so glad I have this. Um, and then also I, I leverage the fact that I grew up in California, went to school in Florida, uh, lived in Chicago, and now I live in Seattle. Um, and in doing that, so attorneys, I, I mentioned a, a few different ways that um, I target them. Um, with accountants, I also like sending ledger overviews because what phishing email is a ledger overview? That's, that's out of, usually that's just not in people's knowledge background. Um, and for the location, it's meeting invites. I encourage all of you, that are fishing to take yourself, think about it, what, are, what makes you unique? What makes you special? And target that because you speak their language better than anyone else. No one else, like people, uh, my, my coworkers that have tried to copy my legal emails and like maybe just change a few words, to me are, I'm like, oh, that's, that's not how attorneys talk, blah, blah, blah. You just wanna be real and the best way to be real is just being real. Um, I'll skip, I'll skip over that just uh, for the sake of time. Um, I think that this is the most important slide in, in, the, um, in the talk is how happy do you wanna be and who do you wanna be? Um, I stole this from, um, <laughs> from, from uh, the Mimi Cats creators, but for me, I wanted to be a technical resource. And there was a lot of barriers getting in the way of that, right? I, I ha was a business major. There's all these different things. And the narrative that I was telling myself was, I am a business major. I am this. I am that. And that's all stuff in my head. Those are those groups that I assigned to myself and people told me. We tell ourselves stuff every day without realizing it. We, we ingest 100,000 words a day, which is equivalent to a, um, a three-hour uh, three book, like reading a three-hour book. And a lot of that information we choose to receive. So if you look at your Twitter feed, if you use Twitter, you, the people that you follow, the information that you receive, make it positive and make it so a way that empowers you. If, you wanna, if you're not happy in your current role, Maybe your, your dream role isn't attainable at this time, but start telling yourself a narrative that you are good enough for something else. Um, for me, a big change was the, the, the first time that I called myself a, um, 
a red teamer because I, I was, I, like, it, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of repetition of, of having notes on my wall saying, I do red teaming, blah, blah, blah. But the, the narrative I'd always given myself was, I am not technical. I don't have a computer science background, despite being good at it. And, and, and thinking that you can change the way, when, once you start thinking about yourself differently, your entire persona changes. And then what you say your strength